All right, folks, as I promised you, we are going to get into the State of the Union. Now, this has been difficult for me because I have on purpose refrained from watching it from last week so that I can bring to you my live and very raw reaction. Now, I want to simply say this. I will interrupt this video quite a bit because I am sure I will be motivated by some emotion based on what it is that I'm watching. And I just want to remind everybody, what I'm doing here is a reaction video. So you should expect to see me stop this video a lot and react. And I hope that what I bring to the table will be something very valuable to you. So Let's get right into it. Without further ado, what I will actually, where the, the place I will actually start is where you actually see the president uh, handing over a copy of his speech to both the vice president and the speaker of the house because those are the two presiding over uh, the uh, combined uh, joint session of Congress here, which of course that's what the State of the Union is all about. So let's watch it and then we'll get into it. I know there will be a lot to say here, so... Get some popcorn. We're going to have some fun. All right, here we go. Oh, technical error. Let me do that one more time. Okay. <laughs> Tony. You ever notice that the person doing the hand signing is actually far more like brighter and happier than the president? <laughs> I'm just saying. Already my observation. Yeah, this is going to be a long video. <laughs> okay, sorry. Here we go. Two. Good evening. Good evening. If I were smart, I'd go home now. That's probably the most intelligent thing he'll say in the whole address. <laughs> All right, I got to give it to him. That was pretty funny, okay? All those joke writers, I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> I mean, it was funny. It's funny, okay? I, I, I'll give him credit for that. It's funny. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Madam Vice President, members of Congress, my fellow Americans, in January 1941, Franklin Roosevelt came to this chamber to speak to the nation, and he said, I address you at a moment unprecedented in the history of the Union. Hitler was on the march. War was raging in Europe. President Roosevelt's purpose was to wake up Congress and alert the American people that this was no ordinary time. Freedom and democracy were under assault in the world. Tonight, I come to this same chamber to address the nation. Now, it's we who face an unprecedented moment in the history of the Union. And yes, my purpose tonight is to wake up the Congress and alert the American people that this is no ordinary moment either. Yeah, I would agree with that. It's definitely no ordinary moment. And the extraordinary circumstances that exist in this country have been created by not only him as our leader, but by the sin of the people that wanted him. But that's a whole other story. I'm not even going to get into it. But I kind of feel like I need subtitles to be able to understand because he's at the beginning of the speech and he's already mumbling a little bit. But I, I don't know. Uh, again, this is my first reaction, okay? Maybe other people have provided these types of insights. I don't know. I have kept myself away from all of these moments so that I can bring this video to you. Not since President Lincoln and the Civil War have freedom and democracy been under assault at home as they are today. What makes our moment rare is that freedom and democracy are under attack at both at home and overseas. Can I just say this? I, I, and I, and I'll, I'll let him go on with some of this nonsense that he's saying. We're not a democracy. We're a republic. We're a constitutional republic for that matter. Why do we... Why do... Uh, I, I, 
I don't know why these guys get away with continuing to make those types of assertions. And I know everybody does it. I know everybody says it's a democracy. It's not. It's a republic. Two very different government organizations. At the very same time, <clears throat> overseas, Putin of Russia is on the march, invading Ukraine and sowing chaos throughout Europe and beyond. If anybody in this room thinks Putin will stop at Ukraine, I assure you, he will not. I'm sorry. This is the State of the Union. The Republic, the state, the United States of America. Why are we, I, whatever. I'm, I'm, he's starting by talking about Russia and Putin. Why don't we talk about the nonsense that's going on in our own country? I, I'm, I'm, I, we know th Russia's already won, folks. I don't even know why this, I, I, anyway. Okay, I'm, I promise you the rest of this video is going to be me ranting. But I just thought I would just right off the bat say something because he's a hustler. This is crazy. But Ukraine... Ukraine can stop Putin. Ukraine can stop Putin. That's a lie. Ukraine can't stop Putin. Ukraine with all of NATO can't stop Putin. If you just take all of the weapons and the rounds that get put into those weapons, NATO, including the United States of America, combined with Ukraine, does not have the manufacturing capacity of Russia. That is true. That is a fact. I, I, I promise you, that is a fact. So why does he continue to say this? So that we can prep our, our kids to die in a country that we don't understand? Half the people clapping for the president right now don't even know where the Ukraine is. They don't know where you, they have no clue. Probably couldn't tell us what continent Ukraine sits on. If we stand with Ukraine and provide the weapons that needs to defend itself. That is all. That is all Ukraine is asking. They're not asking for American soldiers. In fact, there are no American soldiers at war in Ukraine, and I'm determined to keep it that way. He's lying. We have American soldiers in Ukraine. That's a lie. We know that that's a lie. The, the, I, don't, I do not understand why he continues to speak these lies. We know the truth. But now, assistance to Ukraine is being blocked by those who want to walk away from our world leadership. It wasn't long ago when a Republican president named Ronald Reagan thundered, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Now. And when Gorbachev finally tore down that wall, we made a promise to Russia that NATO would not expand. And we've expanded NATO. Need I say more? Now my predecessor, a former Republican president, tells Putin, quote, do whatever the hell you want. That's a quote. A former president actually said that, bowing down to a Russian leader, I think it's outrageous, it's dangerous, and it's unacceptable. <laughs> I'm going to make a prediction. I'm going to predict that he mentions Trump more times, whether it be by name or indirectly, than any other president would mention a former president. We are at the end of his term, and now he is going to bash the former president because he knows that the former president is up to bat and is likely going to win the election if we all do the right things. But I will bet you that this president right here is going to utilize the State of the Union as a campaign speech to bash President Trump. I promise you that's going to happen. He's already started. Let the games continue. America, 
as a founding member of NATO, the military alliance of democratic nations created after World War II prevent, to prevent war and keep the peace. And today, we've made NATO stronger than ever. We welcomed Finland to the alliance last year. And just this morning, Sweden officially joined, and their minister is here tonight. They're going to stand up. He wants you to be excited and proud over the fact that they have broken their word to Russia. Like, Russia, take down these walls, and we promise you we will not expand NATO, and they continue to expand NATO, and you wonder why. This is the war machine. I, I, I'm sorry, but this is the military industrial complex fueled by the woke industrial complex. I, like, they want war. They're warmongers. That's what they want. Welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And they know how to fight. Mr. Prime Minister, welcome to NATO, the strongest military alliance the world has ever seen. I say this to Congress. We have to stand up to Putin. Send me a bipartisan national security bill. History is literally watching. History is watching. If the United States walks away, it will put Ukraine at risk. Europe is at risk. The free world will be at risk, emboldening others to do what they wish to do us harm. My message to President Putin, who I've known for a long time, is simple. We will not walk away. Observe the uniparty, okay? I, I want you to observe that there are Republicans and Democrats that are standing for this nonsense. Uh, they're clapping for the death of the future. They're clapping for warmongering. That's what they're doing. It's so wicked. This is so wicked. And then he goes on to say, send us a bipartisan national security bill. What is that? Do you, guys, do you understand that he wants to give another $100 billion, $100 billion to Ukraine, and if you took $6.7 billion of that $100 billion, you would make a wall that is of the same kind of strength and power and caliper of the wall that Egypt put on the southern border of Gaza, the same exact wall, $6.7 billion. Heck, let's overestimate and say $12 billion or $20 billion. Take that and set up some real national security. We will not bow down. I will not bow down. In a literal sense, history is watching. History is watching. Just like history watched three years ago on January 6th. Oh. When insurrection stormed this very capital and placed a dagger to the throat of American democracy. Here we go. Insurrection. That's how could the back of American democracy. Uh, <laughs> they are going to throw the January 6th thing in everybody's face, and it is absolutely ridiculous. These people are liars. The president of the United States is lying. He is manipulating things to come to a conclusion that he knows appear will appear to be favorable, but Americans are not dumb, Mr. President. Americans are not stupid. Americans are fully aware of what's going on. Do you guys understand the level of deception? Look, I wanna just say this really quickly, okay? The commitment to carry the insatiable appetite for sin amongst Americans is what's created what we're looking at right here. That's what we're seeing. This is the result of an insatiable appetite for sin. That's what we're looking at. This is ugly. This is truly, truly ugly. Many of you are here on that darkest of days. We all saw with our own eyes the insurrectionists were not patriots. They'd come to stop the peaceful transfer of power, to overturn the will of the people. January 6th lies about the 2020 election and the plots to steal the election posed a great, 
gravest threat to U.S. democracy since the Civil War. But they failed. America stood. America stood strong and democracy prevailed. We must be honest. The threat to democracy must be defended. My predecessor and some of you here seek to bury the truth about January 6th. This is the part that just really kills me. He says you're, you're trying to bury the truth about January the 6th, yet they're the ones that are burying the truth about it. We just had all this information come out about the January 6th committee that investigated all this, how they suppressed all kinds of evidence, exculpatory evidence. They, the lying that they continue to do is absolutely insane. It's, this guy is so dark. He's, he's supposed to deliver a speech to Congress, a joint session of Congress, explaining what the state of the union is, and he's using it as a campaign speech that's based in a bunch of lies. I'm sorry. This is a complete disgrace to the office of the president of the United States. I'm sorry. This is ridiculous. I will not do that. This is the moment to speak the truth and to bury the lies. Here's the simple truth. You can't love your country only when you win. As I've done ever since being elected to office, I ask all of you without regard to party to join together and defend democracy. Remember your oath of office is defending against all threats, foreign and domestic. Yeah. Respect. Respect free and fair elections. Restore trust in our institutions. The domestic that he's talking about are Christians. He's asking these people to defend from Christians. He is a Christian-hating man. So are the people in his party. I want to make myself very clear. We talked about what happened with Jack Hibbs. We've talked about what's happened to many other people. Who they, the people that they are calling domestic terrorists are people who believe in Christ and will stand up for the truth. That's what we're seeing right now. And make clear, political violence has absolutely no place, no place in America, zero place. Again, it's not, it's not hyperbole to suggest History is watching. We're watching. Your children and grandchildren will read about this day and what we do. History is watching another assault on freedom. Join us the light is Latoya Beasley, a social worker from Birmingham, Alabama. 14 months ago, 14 months ago, she and her husband welcomed a baby girl thanks to the miracle of IVF. She scheduled treatments to have that second child. But the Alabama Supreme Court shut down IVF treatments across the state unleashed by a Supreme Court decision overturning Roe v. Wade. She was told her dream would have to wait. What her family had got through should never have happened. Unless Congress acts, it could happen again. So tonight, let's stand up for families like hers. To my friends across the aisle, don't keep this waiting any longer. Isn't it ironic that he's talking about IVF, which is an attempt by a couple to fertilize an egg and uh, have give birth to a child, He's using the subject of IVF to actually make a case for why abortion should be federally mandated and legalized. Do, do, we, do we see the irony in this garbage? Do, do we see the lies in all of this? And the issue that has erected regarding the IVF function here is something that is so completely out of context on so many levels by this president. I, I, I would be willing to bet you he doesn't even understand the ruling or the case, which by the way, the case is remarkable. There are some remarkable implications pulled from this case that are very valid and they all go back to protecting human life. So this president is lying to you or his handlers are telling him to lie to you and he's just doing what he's being told. Guarantee the right to AVF. 
Did he just say guarantee the right to AVF? I think he just, I think that's what he just said. Oh, goodness. Guarantee it nationwide. Like most Americans, I believe Roe v. Wade got it right. I thank Vice President Harris for being an incredible leader, defending reproductive freedom, and so much more. That wild, I want to thank Vice President Harris for standing up for the mutilation and dismemberment and murder of black babies across the country. Isn't that great? Let's give her a hand, everybody. Thank you. My predecessor came to office determined to see Roe v. Wade overturned. He's the reason it was overturned, and he brags about it. Look at the chaos that has resulted. Join us tonight is Kate Cox. Look at the chaos that has resulted from the fact that 1,500 black babies are killed every single day in this country, and now because of Roe v. Wade being overturned, that number is closer to 1,000. Look at the chaos that has come over the fact that 500 black babies every day are being saved. I, I just can't. I, I can't. I just can't. This is crazy. Cuckoo! Cuckoo! I'm sorry. This is crazy. The wife and mother from Dallas... She's become pregnant again and had a fetus of a fatal condition. Her doctor told Kate that her own life and her ability to have children in the future were at risk if she didn't act. Because Texas law banned her ability to act, Kate and her husband had to leave the state to get what she needed. It is illegal in the state of Texas, thank you, Jesus, to commit an abortion, to commit murder. Okay, there are very rare situations and those situations are almost undocumented where a situation like that involves the danger of a mother's life. In most of those cases, that baby is already dead. That baby is stillborn. I'm not going to get into the medical issues here. But I will, I will bet my life on the fact that the president of the United States is taking something out of context with this story in Texas. I'm telling you that right now. This is ridiculous. This is, this is obscene. Uh, it's, it's crazy. And by the way, I've been in the state of Texas looking at the billboards that Gavin Newsom has made saying, I know it's illegal for you to kill your baby here, but I'm going to do a godly thing and I'm going to let you kill your baby in the state of California and I'll pay you to do it because I'm a good neighbor. Sorry, that's evil. What her family got through should have never happened as well, but it's happening in too many others. There are state laws banning the freedom to choose, criminalizing doctors, forcing survivors of rape and incest to leave their states to get the treatment they need. It's not treatment. Stop saying that. You're a survivor of rape or incest, and so you have the right to kill that baby? Let me get this straight. If you're a woman, and a man rapes you and you get pregnant, you're telling me that the just judgment for that is to kill the baby and not the rapist? I'm all for killing the rapist. Go ahead. Death penalty. They deserve it. But you're going to sentence the baby to death? And, and he's calling it treatment? What an evil, evil man. I'm sorry. How dark and demonic and evil is that? I'm, I, this, is, this kills me. I, I'm sorry. This is bad. Many of you in this chamber and my predecessor are promising to pass a national ban on reproductive freedom. My God, what freedom else would you take away? My God, what? Again, he just mentioned him again. His, his predecessor. He's mentioning Trump. If you take away my freedom to kill a baby, my God, what else will you take away? What? Do you understand the absurdity in his statement, you guys? Do you understand the marked, just, idiot? Come on. What, what are we doing here? This is crazy. Look, it's a decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. The Supreme Court majority wrote the following. And with all due respect, justices, women are not without electoral, electoral power. 
uh, excuse me, electoral or political power, you're about to realize just how much you get right about that. I can see the demons in that. I really can. And I don't think he understands a word of what that, uh, what that type of terminology even implies in context of the opinion that was rendered by the majority. I, I'm just tell, I'm telling you, not, not one lick of solid legal analysis has been done by this president. He's being told what to say. His handlers are telling him what to say. And that's after he's getting all hyped up on whatever it is he's taking to keep himself awake and alert so he can barely throw out his word salad. I'm sorry. That's murder. That is murder. I'm sorry. Clearly. Clearly. Those bragging about overturning Roe v. Wade have no clue about the power of women, but they found out when reproductive freedom was on the ballot, we won in 2022 and 2020, and we'll win again in 2024. No clue about the power of women, even though you're all about tying them up and taking away their freedom. You're all about destroying their lives. This has nothing to do with the power of women. As a matter of fact, you continue to stand for removing power from women. You don't give a flippin' rip about that. Not one bit. You don't care about women. You never have cared about women because if you did, you would respect and honor the wonder of what God does in the production of life. You, you, you would allow women to do what God has called them to do and experience all the wonderful things that God has for them. I'm sorry, you've lost your mind, Mr. President. You're crazy. You're absolutely nuts. I'm sorry. <clears throat> And God help us, by the way. God help us if we end up voting for him again. Please, please. I, I, I'm sorry, but this is absolutely nuts. This is crazy. I have no idea what these people are thinking. None. If you, if you, the American people, send me a Congress that supports the right to choose, I promise you, I'll restore Roe v. Wade as the law of the land again. <laughs> Folks, America cannot go back. I'm here to, tonight to show what I believe is the way forward, because I know how far we come. Four years ago next week, before I came to office, the country was hit by the worst pandemic and the worst economic crisis in a century. Remember the fear, record losses, Remember the spikes in crime and the murder rate, raging virus that took more than one million American lives. The crime rates are higher than they've ever been in American history. What the heck is he talking about? The, I, I, it's, it's amazing to me. The effects of this virus that they took advantage of. In Americans is ridiculous. Does everybody forget the speech that he said? If y'all are good boys. Then I'll let you have a hot dog and a barbecue outside of your house so long as you wear a mask on the 4th of July. Come on, you guys. We, I hope we can all see through this nonsense. I hope we can see through this liar. I really hope. This is crazy. Loved ones, millions left behind. A mental health crisis of isolation and loneliness. A president, my predecessor, failed the most basic presidential duty that he owes to American people, the duty to care. I think that's unforgivable. The duty to care. First of all, <laughs> let's just talk about this for one second. Where is there a stated duty in that context? I, I, I want to make myself very, very clear. The man doesn't understand what duty is because all he does is breaches his duty. He is negligent by legal definition. His breach of duty on a daily basis is the proximate and actual cause of the damages done to this country. There is a legal description of his level of negligence. So he's going to continue. Like, I, hey, look, I predicted it. I predicted he was going to mention Donald Trump a whole bunch of times, probably not by name because he's being told not to mention him by name. My predecessor, my predecessor, my predecessor, my predecessor. 
It's ridiculous. He's not taking any responsibility for the nonsense he's done, the destruction and the damage that's been done in the last three years. Our military, our military does, is not feared anymore. But at least they know everybody's pronouns, right? Come on, folks. This is, I'm sorry, but this is getting just outright stupid. This is outright stupid. Sorry. I came to office determined to get us through one of the toughest periods in the nation's history. We have. It doesn't make new, but in a, news in a thousand cities and towns, the American people are writing the greatest comeback story never told. <laughs> I just think it's really disgusting when he would take a phrase like the greatest story ever told, which is a direct reference to Christ, and, and, and tie it in somehow to the greatest story never told, which happens to be one of the most tragic stories ever told in the history of our country. What, what a pile of poo-poo. What a bunch of nonsense. So, I'm a little emotional. Can you tell? So let's tell the story here. Tell it here and now. America's comeback is building the future of American possibilities, building an economy from the middle out and the bottom up, not the top down, investing in all America, in all Americans. Can I say this from the middle up and not the top down? How does the middle get any advantage if the top isn't thriving and doing well. Specifically, let me just ask this question. If he starts talking about the anti-top, all right, what about all of the ruling class that continues to make money off the death of the future? Not the people that are actually building businesses and actually making jobs for people. I'm talking about the people that are part of his ruling class that are literally, literally just enjoying the pockets, being filled with money in the name of the future dying make every sure everyone has a fair shot and we leave no one no one behind the pandemic no longer no one behind except the babies you murder every single day the thousands and thousands and thousands of babies you're fighting to murder every single day we're not gonna leave anybody behind unless the baby's in a womb oh yeah there you go controls our lives the vaccines that saved us from covid are now being used to beat cancer by the way i'm not, i'm not even going to get into the depth of the insanity of that statement. I'm, I'm not even gonna get into it because we all know that if I start getting into the technical aspects of this, then this channel will go away. But let me just simply say, he's nuts. The man is crazy. And the only person that's a better liar or lies more often than his press secretary is him. It's, it's, it's just ridiculous. What a ridiculous lie. He, di did he just tell us that the COVID-19 vaccine is actually healing people from cancer? I I'm just going to say this. We need to research that. That's all I'm saying. Turning setback into comeback. That's what America does. That's what America does. Sorry, Mike Johnson. Why are you sitting back there clapping for him? What, what the heck is wrong with you? What, what is he thinking? Nancy Pelosi will sit back there while Trump's doing a speech and rips the State of the Union address. And you're sitting there clapping for this nonsense? Stuff that you say you don't even agree with? I'm sorry. Speaker of the House, wake up. Are you out of your mind? <laughs> Folks, my inherited economy is on the brink. Now our economy is literally the envy of the world. 15 million new jobs in just three years. A record. A record. Problem is this, and here's the thing that nobody will tell you. He says 15 million jobs in three years, yet what most people don't know is to create one job, the average cost was almost $900,000. Okay. That is that is the cost. So if you think about it like this, look at it, um, and 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 I'm and I'm telling you, it's crazy. We have increased our national debt by trillions of dollars under the tenure of this man. Many of those dollars in them doing what they're calling creating jobs. So the amount of money that you're spending to create the jobs is actually sending our economy into a tailspin, and those jobs aren't even anything of any type of substance. And then after you do that, you're going to print more money. And then after that, you're going to create a national minimum wage of $30, $40, $50 so that you can pretty much put a nail in the coffin of every kind of viable business out there. 
and he hates Putin. I, 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 I just, I'm not even going to, I'm, I'm I, honestly, it's like you're working harder to make this country a communist country than the communists are. Unemployment. Unemployment. I'm sorry. I just had to do it. I had to do it. Unemployment. At 50 year lows. Liar. He's a liar. Record 16 million Americans are starting small businesses, and each one is a literal act of hope. With historic job growth and small business growth for black and Hispanics and Asian Americans, 800,000 new manufacturing jobs in America and counting. This president is an enemy to blacks, Hispanics, and Asians. I hope everybody sees that. I've done many, many videos talking about that. The data doesn't lie. He is an enemy, not only of the people, but he is an enemy of the very minorities that he claims to protect. Where is it written we can't be the manufacturing capital of the world? We are, we will. More people have health insurance today. More people have health insurance today than ever before. The racial wealth gap is as small as it's been in 20 years. Wages keep going up. Inflation keeps coming down. Inflation has dropped from 9% to 3%, the lowest in the world, and tending lower. How about I do this? How about I actually just stop stopping this video anytime he's lying, and I just stop the video when he's actually telling the truth, okay? Because he's lying about inflation. Inflation is at an all-time all high. In 2020, if you had $100,000 in the bank, today that $100,000 has the buying power of anywhere from sixty-two dollars to $70,000, depending on what you're buying. Inflation is the worst that it's ever been in this country. The worst that it's ever been, including around the time of the Depression. So let's get real about what's really happening here. Even these people who are on his side are conceding to as much as 18% in some areas of inflation. Okay? I'm sorry, but you're nuts, Mr. President. You've lost your mind and you're a liar. And I will just tell you this. I think at this point, the way that this whole thing works is that we should, in essence, just simply... Stop this video when he actually is telling the truth. Now, I'll stop this video to comment on other things, but I won't stop until he's telling the truth when uh, he tells the truth, which means I won't ever stop the video in order to identify truth-telling. He's a liar. The first truthful statement he made was at the very beginning of this, and that was it. And that was when he said, I should have stayed home. The landing is and will be soft. And now, instead of importing, importing foreign products and exporting American jobs, we're exporting American products and creating American jobs. Right here in America, where they belong. And it takes time, but the American people are beginning to feel it. Consumer studies show consumer confidence is soaring. Buy America. Liar! It's been the law of the land since the 1930s. Past administrations, including my predecessor, including some Democrats as well in the past, failed to buy American. Not anymore. On my watch, Federal Trump failed to buy American? You mean the same Trump that had the Chinese on the ropes? The same Trump that was pretty much winning everywhere? The same Trump that got us energy independent? The same Trump that China feared and Russia feared and everybody else feared? That same Trump? Really? Come on, JoJo. What's wrong with you? Projects that you fund, like helping build American roads, bridges, and highways, will be made with American products and built by American workers. <laughs> Creating good-paying American jobs. And thanks to our Chips and Science Act, the United States is investing more in research and development than ever before. During the pandemic, a shortage of semiconductors, chips, that drove up the price of everything from cell phones to automobiles. And by the way, we invented those chips right here in America. Well, instead of having to import them, instead of we, private companies are now investing billions of dollars to build new chip factories here in America, creating tens of thousands of jobs.
Many of those jobs paying $100,000 a year and don't require a college degree. Those companies that are building chips are building chips because President Trump opened the door for them to be able to build those chips. Let's tell the truth, liar. Let's tell the truth. <clears throat> In fact, my policies have attracted $650 billion dollars in private sector investment, in clean energy, advanced manufacturing, creating tens of thousands of jobs here in America. <clears throat> One of these days, I'll go over the numbers as into why that's a total lie. It will shock you. And thanks to our bipartisan infrastructure law, 46,000 new projects have been announced all across your communities. And by the way, I noticed some of you have strongly voted against it or they're cheering on that money coming in. I like it. I'm with you. I'm with you. And if any of you don't want that money in your district, just let me know. <laughs> Modernizing our roads and bridges, ports and airports, public transit systems. Removing po poisonous lead pipes so every child can drink clean water without risk of brain damage. I think it's so ironic that he's going out of his way to talk about protecting children when he tried to kill them before they got out of the womb. Don't come to me and tell me you, you care about protecting our children when you exploit them all the time, Mr. President. What, what are you doing? <clears throat> Providing affordable, affordable high-speed internet for every American, no matter where you live, urban, suburban, or rural communities, in red states and blue states. Record investments in By the way, that's true. I will tell you that. I'll acknowledge that. He's done, oh, he's worked very, very hard to get high speed internet into everybody for pretty much free because that's the tool that they use to indoctrinate and brainwash people. Uh, and, and there is a lot of truth to that. I will just tell you that right now. By the way, it's being done very inefficiently and it's costing our country a whole lot more money and it's raising our taxes and all kinds of other things. But he is making that a goal because he needs the railway for indoctrination. It's truth. Tribal communities, because of my investment in family farms. He's destroyed family farms. Because I'm you know. family farms led by my sector of agriculture who knows more about this than anybody I know. We're better able to stay in the family for the, those farms for the, and their children and grandchildren. Liar. Leave, Liar. Leave home to make a living. It's transformative. The great comeback story is Belvedere, Illinois. Home to an auto plant for nearly 60 years. Oh, I know where he's going Before with this Before I came one. to office, the plant was on its way to shutting down. Oh. Thousands of workers feared for their livelihoods. Hope was fading. Then I was elected to office and we raised the Belvedere repeatedly with auto companies knowing unions would make all the difference. The UAW worked like hell to keep the plant open and get these jobs back, and together we succeeded. Instead of auto factories shutting down, auto factories reopening, the new state-of-the-art battery factories being built to power those cars there at the same time. The folks of Belvedere, I say, instead of your town being left behind, your community is moving forward again. Because instead of watching auto job, jobs of the future go overseas, 4,000 union jobs with higher wages are building the future in Belvedere right here in America. Here tonight, is UAW President Sean Fain, a great friend and a great labor leader. Sean, where are you? Stand up. And, and Dawn, and Dawn Sims, a third generation worker, UAW worker at Belvedere. Sean, I was proud to be the first president to stand in the picket line, and today, Dawn has a good job in her hometown, providing stability for her family and pride and dignity as well. Showing once again, Wall Street didn't build America. They're not bad guys. They didn't build it, though. The middle class built the country, and unions built the middle class. See, these are all lies that are being told. Look, I'm just telling you this right now. All of us built the country together. And this lie of the middle class, all of us did it. There were contributions 
on every front and to, to continue to minimize the importance of people who own corporations and hire individuals and provide for them jobs where they can make a, a respectable living. This, this is just so crazy. This is, I, 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 I whatever. I say to the American people, when America gets knocked down, we get back up. We keep going. That's America. That's you, the American people. It's because of you America's coming back. It's because of you our future is brighter. It's because of you that tonight we can proudly say the state of our union is strong and getting stronger. Are, are we not tired of this? Is this not just exhausting? This is so exhausting. Four more years. That's what they're saying. Tonight. Four more years. Tonight, I want to talk about the future Heck of no. possibilities. Heck no. That we can build years. together. A future where the days of trickle-down economics are over. And the wealthy and the biggest corporations no longer get the, all the tax breaks. And by the, the days of trickle down economics being over, when in reality, trickle down economics, which came from the man that he just praised a little while ago, President Reagan, talking about tearing down these walls, Gorbachev, is what actually changed and saved the dying condition of our country. I, I like it, 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 let's just go over the truth for just a moment, okay? These are all lies. I understand corporations. I come from a state that has more corporations invested than every one of your states in the state of the United States combined. And I represented for 36 years. I'm not anti-corporation, but I grew up in a home where trickle-down economics didn't put much on my dad's kitchen table. That's why I determined to turn things around so middle class does well. When they do well, the poor are way up and the wealthy still do very well. We all do well. And there's more to do to make sure you're feeling the benefits of all we're doing. Americans pay more for prescription drugs than anywhere in the world. It's wrong, and I'm ending it. He made it more expensive, by the way, just so you know that. He, he did that by a substantial amount. He made it three times as expensive. Just want you to know that. For the law that I proposed and signed, not one of you Republican buddies worked, voted for it, we finally beat Big Pharma. Instead of paying $400 a <laughs> I'm sorry, they finally beat Big Pharma. Oh. <laughs> you mean the Big Pharma that owns you, homie? <laughs> We've beat Big Pharma. Oh, gosh, that's the most entertaining one. That's the funniest one. That was a great joke, Mr. President. A month or thereabouts for insulin with diabetes, and it only costs 10 bucks to make. They only get paid 35 a month now and still make a healthy profit. And I want to... But what to do next? I want to cap the cost of insulin $35 a month for every American who needs it. Everyone. For years, people have talked about it, but finally we got it done and gave Medicare the power to negotiate lower prices on prescription drugs. Just like the- I will say this, by the way, the one who gave Medicare the power to negotiate for a lower price on prescription drugs was something that was done by the Trump administration. It was his rules that were written into effect that actually took full effect after Biden went in, and that is the truth, okay? That is the truth. VA is able to do for veterans. That's not just saving seniors money. It's saving taxpayers money. We cut the federal deficit by $160 billion. Because Medicare will no longer have to pay those exorbitant prices to Big Pharma. This year, Medicare is negotiating lower prices for some of the costliest drugs on the market to treat everything from heart disease to arthritis. 
It's now time to go further and give Medicare the power to negotiate lower prices for 500 different drugs over the next decade. <laughs> They're making a lot of money, guys. And they'll still be extremely profitable. Will not only save lives, it will save taxpayers another $200 billion. <laughs> Starting next year, the same law caps total prescription drug costs for seniors on Medicare at $2,000 a year, even for expensive cancer drugs that cost ten, twelve, fifteen thousand dollars. I want to cap prescription drug costs at two thousand dollars a year for everyone. Yeah. Folks. I'm going to get in trouble for saying that, but if you want to get in Air Force One and fly to Toronto, Berlin, Moscow, I mean, excuse me, and it, well, even Moscow, probably. He's that out and of Bring it. your prescription with you, and I promise you I'll get it for you for 40 percent the cost you're paying now. Cuckoo. Same company, Cuckoo. same drug, same place. Folks, the Affordable Care Act, the old Obamacare, it's, it's still a very big deal. Good Lord. Thank you, Lord. Over 100 million of you can no longer be denied health insurance because of pre-existing condition. But well, my predecessor and many in this chamber the want to take this prescription drug away by repealing the Affordable Care Act. I'm not going to let that happen. We stopped you 50 times before and we'll stop you again. I'm not going to let that happen. I stopped it 50 times before, and I'm going to stop it again. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just can't help myself. In fact, I'm not only protecting it, I'm expanding it. The, we, the enacted tax credits of $800 per person per year reduce health care costs for millions of working families. Oh, that tax credit expires next year. <laughs> I want to make that savings permanent. To state the obvious, women are more than half our population, but research on women's health has always been underfunded. That's why we're launching the first ever White House initiative on women's health research, led by Jill, doing an incredible job as first lady. That is more research into abortion, folks. I just want you to know that. That's what it is. Yep. And gender stuff. Just leave it at that. Yep. We love women. <laughs> That's what he sounds like when you know the truth. So, pa so pass my plan for $12 billion to transfer women's health research and benefit millions of lives all across America. <clears throat> I know the cost of housing is so important to you. If inflation keeps coming down, mortgage rates will come down as well, and the Fed acknowledges that. But I'm not waiting. I want to provide an annual tax credit that will give Americans $400 a month for the next two years as mortgage rates come down to put toward their mortgages when they buy their first home or trade up for a little more space. Just for two years. See, they're all clapping for this, but this is the president wanting to buy the votes of certain people, not recognizing that what he's doing is going to send the markets into complete and total disarray. I, like, I wish people could see this. This is so, it, most, I think most people see this now. They have to be able to see through this. And my administration is also eliminating title insurance on federally backed mortgages. When you refinance your home, you can save $1,000 or more as a consequence. For millions of Translation, when you get yourself into more debt, right? Then we can save you another $1,000. Yeah, it sounds great, doesn't it? 
Renters were cracking down on big landlords who use antitrust law, using antitrust, who break antitrust laws by price fixing and driving up rents. We've cut red tape so builders can get federally financing, which is already helping build a record 1.7 million new house, housing units nationwide. Now pass. Now pass and build and renovate 2 million affordable homes and bring those rents down. <laughs> to remain the strongest economy in the world, we need to have the best education system in the world. Beware what he's about to tell you, and I'm, I, I've never seen this before, but I'm making a prediction. He is going to talk up the brainwashing system. I mean, the education system. And it's the tool that he needs in order to brainwash the future so that they all become people that are part of the slavery system that is the infrastructure of wickedness that these people continue to propagate. My children will never go to public school, ever. And I, like I suspect all of you, want to give a child, every child, a good start by providing access to preschool for three and four years old. You know. Early brainwashing systems. <laughs> Get them while they're young. Yeah. <laughs> I think I pointed out last year. I think I pointed out last year that children coming from broken homes where there's no books, they're not read to, not spoken to very often, start school, kindergarten, or first grade, hearing, having heard a million fewer words spoken. Well, studies show that children who go to preschool are nearly 50% more likely to finish high school, go on to earn a two- and four-year degree, no matter what their background is. I met a year and a half ago with the leaders of the Business Roundtable. They were mad that I, they were angry. I think, well, they were d discussing <laughs> why I wanted to spend money on education. I pointed out to them, as vice president, I met with over eight, I think it was 182 of those folks. Don't hold me the exact number. And uh, I asked them what they need most, the CEOs. And you've had the same experience on both sides, though. They say a better educated workforce, right? So I looked at them, and I say, I come from Delaware. DuPont used to be the eighth largest corporation in the world. And every new inter enterprise they bought, they educated the workforce to that enterprise. But none of you do that anymore. Why are you angry with me, providing you the opportunity for the best educated workforce in the world? And they all looked at me and said, I think you're right. I want to expand high quality tutoring and summer learning to see that every child learns to read by third grade. I'm also connecting local businesses and high schools so students get hands on experience and a path to good paying job, whether or not they go to college. And I want to make sure the college is more affordable. Let's continue increasing the Pell Grants to working and middle-class families and increase record investments in HBCUs and minority-serving institutions, including Hispanic institutions. When I was told I couldn't universally just change the way in which we did, dealt, dealt with student loans, I fixed two student loan programs that already existed. To and broke the law doing it on a whole bunch of levels and actually took a whole bunch of money out of people's pockets um, that belonged to them and not the government and then gave it to people that it didn't belong to. That, that's a whole other story. It's the burden of student debt for nearly 4 million Americans, including nurses, firefighters, and others in public service. Like Keenan Jones, a public educator from Minnesota, Who's here with us tonight? Keenan, where are you? Keenan, thank you. He's educated hundreds of students so they can go to college, 
Now he's able to help, after debt forgiveness, get his own daughter to college. And folks, look. Such relief is good for the economy because folks are now able to buy a home, start a business, start a family. While we're at it, I want to give public school teachers a raise. Give many of them a raise for brainwashing your children. There are some amazing public school teachers, by the way, and that we really, really need. But, you know, when you give people a raise, you also give them accountability, and there's none of that there. It's, it's just very, very sad. And if there's a Christian school teacher listening to me right now, stay in the fight. We need you. This is a dying cause, but your efforts are helping take the edge off of the destruction that's happening right now. And by the way, the first couple of years, we cut the deficit. Now, let me speak to the question of fundamental fairness for all Americans. I've been delivering real results in fiscally responsible ways. We've already cut the federal deficit. We've already cut the federal deficit over a trillion dollars. I signed the bipartisan deal to cut another trillion dollars in the next decade. It's my goal to cut the federal deficit another three trillion by making big corporations very wealthy finally beginning to pay their fair share. Look, I'm a capitalist. If you want to make or can make a million or millions of bucks, that's great. Just pay your fair share in taxes. What's your fair share? 70%, 60%, 50%? That's what they're talking about, by, by the way. Yeah. If a guy makes a million dollars, he might pay more taxes than somebody who is making $100,000, meaning he clears more money in his pocket, the $100,000 earner, than the million-dollar earner. That's how bad it is, folks. Yep. A fair tax code is how we invest things to make this country great. Health care, education, defense, and so much more. But here's the deal. The last administration enacted a $2 trillion tax cut. Overwhelmingly benefit the top 1%, the very wealthy, the biggest corporation, and exploded the federal deficit. Previous administration, previous administration, previous administration, previous administration, blame Trump, blame Trump, blame Trump, blame Trump, when you can't even remember your own name, dude. They added more to the national debt than any presidential term in American history. Check the numbers. Folks at home, does anybody really think the tax code is fair? No. Do you really think the wealthy and big corporations need another $2 trillion tax break? No. I sure don't. I'm going to keep fighting like hell to make it fair. Under my plan, nobody earning less than $400,000 a year will pay additional penny in federal taxes. Nobody, not one penny. And they haven't yet. In fact, the child tax credit I passed during the pandemic cut taxes for millions of working families and cut child poverty in half. Come on, he cut child poverty in half, really? Those numbers have increased. What's he talking about? Restore that child tax credit. No child should go hungry in this country. The way to make the tax credit code fair is to make big corporations the very wealthy begin to pay their fair share. Remember in 2020, 55 of the biggest companies in America made $40 billion and paid zero in federal income tax. Zero. Not anymore. Thanks to the law I wrote and we signed, big companies have to pay a minimum of 15%. But that's still less than working people pay in federal taxes. It's time to raise corporate minimum tax to at least 21 percent. So in other words, it's time to rip corporations off of their ability to be able to hire employees. I'm not this big corporate machine structure defender, but I'm just saying, let's just be truthful about what's really going on, you liars. Every big corporation finally begins to pay their fair share. 
I also want to end tax breaks for big pharma, big oil, private checks, massive executive pay when it's only supposed to be a million, a million dollars that could be deducted. They can pay them 20 million if they want, but deduct a million. End it now. You know, there are 1,000 billionaires in America. You know what the average federal tax is for those billionaires? No. They're making great sacrifices, 8.2 percent. That's far less than the vast majority of Americans pay. No billionaire should pay a lower federal tax rate than a teacher, a sanitation worker, or a nurse. Hey, look at Bernie putting on his mask. <laughs> you got to love it. Look at our comrade. I propose a minimum tax for billionaires of 25 percent, just 25 percent. You know what that would raise? That would raise $500 billion over the next 10 years. Over the next 10 years, that would pay for all that we've given Ukraine so far over the next 10 years. Yep, folks, that's some reality. And imagine what that could do for America. Imagine a future with affordable child care. Millions of families can get they need to go to work to help grow the economy. Imagine a future with paid leave because no one should have to choose between working and taking care of their sick family member. Imagine. Imagine a future of home care and elder care and people living with disabilities so they can stay in their homes and family caregivers can finally get the pay they deserve. Tonight, let's all agree once again to stand up for seniors. Many of my friends on the other side of aisle want to put Social Security on the chopping block. If anyone here tries to cut Social Security, Medicare, or raise the retirement age, I will stop you. The working people, the working people who built this country pay more into Social Security than millionaires and billionaires do. It's not fair. We have two ways to go. Republicans can cut Social Security and give more tax breaks to the wealthy. I will, that's the proposal. Oh, no. You guys don't want another $2 trillion tax cut? I kind of thought that's what your plan was. Well, that's good to hear. You're not going to cut another $2 trillion for the super wealth. That's good to hear. I'll protect and strengthen Social Security and make the wealthy pay their fair share. Look. Too many corporations raise prices to pad their profits, charging more and more for less and less. That's why we're cracking down on corporations and engaging in price gouging and deceptive pricing, from food to health care to housing. In fact, the snack companies think you won't notice if they change the size of the bag and put a hell of a lot fewer, <laughs> same, same size bag, put fewer chips in it. Oh, here we go with the Super Bowl commercial nonsense. Did you guys see that commercial? I didn't watch the Super Bowl. I just saw a portion of that thing being replayed where he talked about my potato chip bag is a lot smaller. Here we go again, dude. No, I'm not joking. It's called shrinkflation. Pass Bobby Casey's bill and stop this. I really mean it. You would stop shrinkflation if you actually stopped Bidenflation. That's what you would do. You probably all saw that commercial on Snickers bars. You get, you get charged the same amount, and you got about, I don't know, 10% fewer Snickers in it. Look, I'm also getting rid of junk fees. Those hidden fees. At the end of your bill, they're there without your knowledge. My administration announced we're cutting credit card late fees from $32 to $8. God forbid that you just pay for your credit card on time. Yeah, God forbid that you would actually not spend money that you don't have. Like, that would be terrible if you learned how to do that. That'd be terrible. 
Banks and credit card companies are allowed to charge what it costs them to, in, to instigate the, re, the, the collection. And that's more a hell of a lot, like $8 and 30-some dollars. If they're only allowed to pay for what would instigate the cost of uh, collection, how do they make profit on letting you borrow money? Why would I let you borrow money if you're not going to give me interest? Like, do we understand the absurdity of a statement? Come on. They don't like it. The credit card companies don't like it. But I'm saving American families $20 billion a year with all the junk fees I'm eliminating. <laughs> Folks at home, that's why the banks are so mad. It's $20 billion in profit. I'm not stopping there. My administration has proposed rules to make cable, travel, utilities, and online ticket sellers tell you the total price up front so there are no surprises. It matters. It matters. And so does this. In November, my team began serious negotiation with a bipartisan group of senators. The result was a bipartisan bill with the toughest set of border security reforms we've ever seen. Oh, here we go with this liar with the border security. He's really going to talk about the fact that he did something good for the border that he created. Do you guys understand how biblical it is to maintain a safe border? I, I, I don't, what is, someone needs to just call him out. It's like, come on, man. People have died. Tons of people have died. The, the illegal alien problem that we have is worse than we've ever had before in the history of this country. And he's talking about secure borders. I, like who, what were the, what were the speech writers thinking in actually having him mention the border? He should have never mentioned the border. It's a huge mistake. Notice how everybody started booing him. They should. He's blown it. Oh, you don't think so? Oh, you don't like that bill, huh? That conservatives got together and said it was a good bill. I'll be darned. That's amazing. Look at the smirk on Mike Johnson's face, too, because uh, he finally gave in on that bill, which he shouldn't have ever given in because that bill was not for our border. That bill was for Ukraine. And that's just so ridiculous. And people are still dying because of the fact that we don't put money into our own border, but we put it into the border of other people. It's ridiculous. Corrupt people, by that, by, for that matter. We are being unbiblical about the way we are managing our country. That bipartisan bill would hire 1,500 more security agents and officers, 100 more immigration judges to help tackle the backload of 2 million cases, 4,300 more asylum officers, and new policies so they can resolve cases in six months instead of six years now. How about instead of making the goal of solving the cases from six years to six months, we actually not let people in the country until we get it all squared away? And how about we deport everybody who's completely breaking all the laws that are destroying our country instead of helping our country? How about we start thinking like that? If he knows there's a six-year backlog, then how is he letting them in by the billions? I mean, by the millions. How in the world is that happening? How can he let people in by the millions? Criminals by the millions knowing there's a six-year backlog. He's out of his mind, and so are his people. They hate our country. That's the reality of it. What are you against? One hundred more high-tech drug detection machines to significantly increase the ability to screen and stop vehicles smuggling fentanyl into America. That's killing thousands of children. This bill would save lives. He's talking about saving thousands of children from being killed when he's killing thousands of them every single day. Every single day they're being killed with abortion. And now he's talking about saving them at the border when he's exploiting them at the border by letting people in. He, guys, I hope you see the kind of liar that this man is. Man, he needs to get called out on this nonsense. The Democrats need to call him out on this nonsense, but they won't because they love him. They love him. And the Republicans are not going to call him out either because none of them are willing to be bold about this. I mean, wouldn't it just be great if somebody could just like get up in the middle of the State of Union and go, hey, you broke the law. You know, that'll never happen. I mean, obviously, I'm not for anybody disrupting anything. But I mean, the reality of it is, what are you doing? Come on, that's crazy. I'm going to order the border. It'll also give me and any new president new emergency authority to temporarily shut down the border when the number of migrants at the border is overwhelming. The Border Patrol Union has endorsed this bill. 
The Federal Chamber of Commerce is a, yeah, yeah. You're saying low. Look at the facts. I know. I know you know how to read. I don't know who he's talking to because someone, I guess, is heckling him. But here's the thing about all of this, right? Let's look at the facts. The fact is we've had more people illegally enter this country in the last few years than any other time in American history. Okay? That's the fact. The fact is he's opened up the border and he's allowed people to come in. There are people wearing Biden-Harris shirts, illegals, as they're coming in. We have Middle Eastern terrorists coming into the border. Come on. Let's get real, folks. I believe that given the opportunity for a majority in the House and Senate would endorse the bill as well, a majority right now. But unfortunately, politics has derailed this bill so far. I'm told my predecessor called members of Congress in the Senate to demand they block the bill. He feels political win, he viewed it as a, be a political win for me and a political loser for him. It's not about him, it's not about me. I'd be a winner not really. I. What in the world did she just say? Who was it that said that? Someone just heckled him. Lincoln, Lincoln Riley, an innocent young woman who was killed by an illegal. That's right. But how many of the thousands of people being killed by legals? To her parents, I say, my heart goes out to you, having lost children myself. Did he just say killed by illegals? His own administration said they're not allowed to use the word illegals anymore. D did I just hear that? <laughs> oh, gosh. <coughs> pull off the popcorn there's going to be a lot of stuff in the media over this one i have been paying attention folks that's crazy right there that is crazy i understand but look if we change the dynamic at the border people pay people people pay these smugglers eight thousand bucks to get across the border because they know if they get by if they get by and let into the country it's six to eight years before they have a hearing and it's worth the, taking the chance of the $8,000. Of course! But if it's only six months, six weeks, the idea is it's highly unlikely that people will pay that money and come all that way knowing that they'll be able to be kicked out quickly. That's not true. If it's two days, they would still do it because in two days, they just won't show up to court. Come on! Everybody can see this except you? Come on. Folks... I would respectfully say to suggest my friend and my Republican friends owe it to the American people, get this bill done. We need to act now. And if my predecessor is watching, instead of paying politics, and pressuring members of Congress to block the bill, join me in telling the Congress to pass it. We can do it together, but that's what he apparently hears what he will not do. I will not demonize immigrants saying they are poison in the blood of our country. I will. I will. When they're illegal, they're poison. When they're breaking the law, they're poison. My mom and my dad were both born and raised in Egypt. They came into the country legally. Do not slap me in the face, you evil man. I'm sorry. There is nothing wrong with saying things like that. And do not put president. If there's one thing you're not going to knock President Trump over, it's the border issue. Give me a break. Give me a break, you liars. Not separate families. <laughs> I will not ban people because of their faith. Unlike my predecessor on my first day in office, I introduced a comprehensive bill to fix our immigration system. Take a look at it as all these and more. Secure the border. Provide a pathway to citizenship for dreamers, and so much more. But unlike my predecessor, I know who we are as Americans. We're the only nation in the world with a heart and soul that draws from old and new. Home to Native Americans and ancestors have been here for thousands of years. Home to people of every place, from every place on earth. They came freely, 
Some came in chains. Some came when famine struck, like my ancestral family in Ireland. Some the Isn't it funny when he talks about some came in chains? Coming out of his, out of his mouth. We don't know why. Persecution. To chase dreams that are impossible anywhere but here in America. That's America. And we all come from somewhere. But we're all Americans. <laughs> <laughs> Look, folks, we have a simple choice. We can fight about fixing the border, or we can fix it. You broke it. You broke it! I'm ready to fix it. Send me the border bill now. A transformational moment in history happened 58, 59 years ago today in Selma, Alabama. Hundreds of foot soldiers for justice marched across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, named after the Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan. He's going to bring up Selma in the context of illegal immigration. To claim their fundamental right to vote. They were beaten. They were bloody and left for dead. Our late friend and former colleague John Lewis was on that march. We miss him. But joining us tonight, our other marchers, both in the gallery and on the floor, including Betty Mae Fikes, known as the voice of Selma, the daughter of gospel singers and preachers, she sang songs of prayer and protest on that bloody Sunday to help shake the nation's conscience. Five months later, the Voting Rights Act passed and was signed into law. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But 59 years later, their force is taking us back in time. Voter suppression, election subversion, unlimited dark money, extreme gerrymandering. John Lewis was a great friend to many of us here. But if you truly want to honor him and all the heroes of march with him, then it's time to do more than talk. Pass the Freedom to Vote Act, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. So let me tell you what this act is going to end up doing. This act is going to end up requiring that no voting centers actually ask for ID. So that means people without ID are going to be able to come in and vote. We require them to have ID to drive a vehicle. We require them to have ID to buy certain types of uh, grocery items. We require IDs to do all kinds of things. They're required IDs to collect welfare. Yet we're going to, we're going to say that it's racist to make them have voter ID this is their attempt at keeping power forever in this country. This is them seeking to convert this republic into a totalitarian ruled state. That's what they're doing. That, that's exactly where they're going with this. And stop. Stop denying another core value of America. Our diversity across American life. Banning books. It's wrong. Instead of erasing history, let's make history. I want to protect fundamental rights. The translation of banning books is wrong, meaning it's okay to ban the Bible, but we're going to allow any LGBT, LG, alphabet mafia, blah, 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 books that exploit children sexually, we're going to allow those to be in libraries. That's, that's what he's basically saying here. Pass the Equality Act. And my message to transgender Americans, <laughs> I have your back. Pass the PRO Act for workers' rights. Raise the federal minimum wage because every worker has a right to a decent living more than eight, seven bucks an hour. We're also making history by confronting the climate crisis, not denying it. I don't think any of you think there's no longer a climate crisis. 
At least I hope you don't. <laughs> I'm taking the most significant action ever on climate in the history of the world. I'm cutting our carbon emissions in half by 2030, creating tens of thousands of clean energy jobs like the IBW work is building and installing 500,000 electric vehicle charging stations. <laughs> Conserving 30 percent of America's lands and waters by 2030. And taking action on environmental justice fence line communities smothered by the legacy of pollution. In pattern after the Peace Corps and America Corps, I launched the Climate Corps to put 20,000 young people to work in the forefront of our clean energy future. I'll triple that number in a decade. The climate policies will be the very tools that the United States will fall on. These will be the very things that will cause a certain level of totalitarian rule fueled by the lust and insatiable desire for sin, and it will destroy our country. We're already on that path. To state the obvious, all Americans deserve the freedom to be safe, and America is safer today than when I took office. Year before I took office, murder rates went up 30 percent. 30 percent they went up. I'm glad that they're heckling. The biggest increase in history. It was then, through, no, through my American Rescue Plan, which every American voted against, I'm at. I have no idea what he was saying. I'll have to go back and look at that later. I have no idea. But I can tell you this. We are not in a safer country because of Joe Biden. We're in a much less safer country. We made the largest investment in public safety ever. Last year, the murder rate saw the sharpest decrease in history. Violent crime fell to one of its lowest levels in more than 50 years. Liar! But we have more to do. We have to help cities invest in more community police officers, more mental health workers, more community violence intervention. Give communities the tool to crack down on gun crime, retail crime, and carjacking. Keep building trust, as I've been doing, by taking executive action on police reform and calling for it to be the law of the land. Directing my cabinet to review the federal classification of marijuana and expunging thousands of convictions for the mere possession, because no one should be jailed for simply using or having on their record. Notice how Kamala Harris jumped up well before he even finished his statement. Why? Because she likes smoking the ganja. Mm-hmm. Take on crimes of domestic violence. I'm ramping up the Federal Enforcement of the Violence Against Women Act that I proudly wrote when I was a senator. So we can finally, finally end the scourge against women in America. There are other kinds of violence I want to stop. With us tonight is Jasmine, whose nine-year-old sister Jackie was murdered with 21 classmates and teachers in elementary school in Uvalde, Texas. Very soon after that happened, Jill and I went to Uvalde for a couple of days. We spent hours and hours with each of the families. We heard their message, so everyone in this room and this chamber could hear the same message. The constant refrain, and I was there for hours meeting with every family. They said, do something. Do something. Well, I did do something by establishing the first ever Office of Gun Violence Prevention in the White House with the vice president leading the charge. While allowing the legal aliens to come into this country that are doing a majority of the gun violence that you're, the gun violence that you're talking about. Yeah, no, you're really doing something. Thank you for doing it. <clears throat> Meanwhile, <laughs> Meanwhile, my predecessor told the NRA He's proud he did nothing on guns when he was president. Oof. After another shooting in Iowa recently, he said, when asked what to do about it, he said, just get over it. There's his quote, just get over it. I said, I promise you he is mischaracterizing what was said and he's completely taking something out of context because this former president, President Trump, loved people and has always loved people. That's ridiculous. Stop it.
Stop it, stop it, stop it. <clears throat> I'm proud we beat the NRA when I signed the most significant gun safety law in nearly 30 years because of this Congress. We now must beat the NRA again. I'm demanding a ban on assault weapons and high-capacity magazines. Pass universal background checks. None of this. None of this. I taught the Second Amendment for 12 years. None of this violates the Second Amendment or vilifies responsible gun owners. Yes, it does. It violates the Second Amendment, and it absolutely vilifies responsible gun owners. We are an armed citizenry, and you, Mr. President, want to ruin an armed citizenry. You want to destroy it so that you can do what you want to do as a totalitarian ruler. That's the fact. You know, as we manage challenges at home, we're also managing crises abroad, including in the Middle East. I know the last five months have been gut-wrenching for so many people for the Israeli people, for the Palestinian people, and so many here in America. This crisis began on October 7th with a massacre by a terrorist group called Hamas, as you all know. 1,200 innocent people, women and girls, men and boys, slaughtered after enduring sexual violence. The deadliest day of the, for the Jewish people since the Holocaust, and 250 hostages taken. Here in this chamber tonight are families whose loved ones are still being held by Hamas. I pledge to all the families that we will not rest until we bring every one of your loved ones home. We also <clears throat> we will also work around the clock to bring home Evan and Paul, Americans being unjustly detained by the Russians and others around the world. Israel has the right to go after Hamas. Hamas ended this conflict by releasing hostages, laying down arms, could end it by, by releasing the hostages, laying down arms, and su surrendering those responsible for October 7th. But Israel has a, <coughs> excuse me, Israel has a added burden because Hamas hides and operates among the civilian population like cowards, under hospitals, daycare centers, and all the like. Israel also has a fundamental responsibility, though, to protect innocent civilians in Gaza. <clears throat> I would argue that Hamas has that fundamental responsibility, and they breach that responsibility when they choose to continue to attack Israel while hiding in those cowardly positions. This is the problem of Hamas. This is not the problem of Israel. It's a problem of Israel because of the continual attacks that continue to happen. This is ridiculous. This man is an anti-Semitic man. I'm going to just tell you that right now. He is fully anti-Semitic. This war... has taken a greater toll on innocent civilians than all previous wars in Gaza combined. More than 30,000 Palestinians have been killed, most of whom are not Hamas. Thousands and thousands of innocents, women and children, girls and boys, also orphaned. Nearly two million more Palestinians under bombardment or displacement. Homes destroyed, neighbors in rubble, cities in ruin, families without food, water, medicine. It's heartbreaking. I've been working nonstop to establish an immediate ceasefire that would last for six weeks to get all the prisoners released, all the hostages released, and to get the hostages home and ease the intolerable and humanitarian crisis and build toward an enduring, a more, something more enduring. The United States has been leading international efforts to get more humanitarian assistance to Gaza. Tonight, I'm directing the U.S. military to lead an emergency mission to establish a temporary pier in the Mediterranean on the coast of Gaza that can receive large shipments carrying food, water, medicine, and temporary shelters. No U.S. boots will be on the ground. A temporary pier will enable a massive increase in the amount of humanitarian assistance getting into Gaza every day. <clears throat> I've got an idea. How about we just let Israel do what Israel needs to do in order to defend itself? How about we just do that? How about we just back off and we just let Israel do what Israel needs to do? 
I think it could make a lot of difference for a lot of people. Israel must do its part. Israel must allow more aid in the Gaza to ensure humanitarian workers aren't caught in the crossfire. And they're announcing that humanitarian workers like UNRWA who joined in with Hamas to destroy Israeli lives, those humanitarian workers? They're going to call, have a crossing in northern Gaza. To the leadership of Israel, I say this. Humanitarian assistance cannot be a secondary consideration or a bargaining chip. Protecting and saving innocent lives has to be a priority. As we look to the future, the only real solution to the situation is a two-state solution over time. No, it isn't. <clears throat> a two-state solution will kill Jews. Palestinians don't want a two-state solution, folks. The Palestinians want a one-state solution from the river to the sea. They say it every day. And I say this as a lifelong supporter of Israel. My entire career, no one has a stronger record with Israel than I do. I challenge anyone. Liar, here. your predecessor does. I'm the only American president of Israel in wartime. But there is no other path that guarantees Israel's security and democracy. There is no other path that guarantees Palestinians can live in peace with, with peace and dignity. And there's no other path that guarantees peace between Israel and all of its neighbors, including Saudi Arabia, with whom I'm talking. Creating stability in the Middle East also means containing the threat posed by Iran. That's why I built a coalition of more than a dozen countries to defend international shipping and freedom of navigation in the Red Sea. I've ordered strikes to degrade the Houthi capability and defend U.S. forces in the region. As Commander-in-Chief, I will not hesitate to direct further measures to protect our people and our military personnel. <clears throat> For years, I've heard many of my Republican and Democratic friends say that China is on the rise and America's falling behind. They've got it backwards. I've been saying it for over four years, even when I wasn't president. America's rising. We have the best economy in the world. And since I've come to office, our GTP is up. Our trade deficit with China is down to the lowest point in over a decade. And we're standing up against China's unfair economic practices. We're standing up for peace and stability across the Taiwan Straits. I revitalized our partnership and alliance in the Pacific. India, Australia, Japan, South Korea, Pacific Islands. I've made sure that the most advanced American technologies can't be used in China, not allowing to trade them there. Frankly, for all this tough talk on China, it never occurred to my predecessor to do any of that. I want competition with China, not conflict. And we're in a stronger position to win the conflict. He, he, he wants to support China, folks. He, he doesn't treat China as an enemy. He's lying. Like the 21st century against China than anyone else for that matter, than any time as well. Here at home, I've signed over 400 bipartisan bills. There's more to pass my unity agenda. Strengthen penalties on fentanyl trafficking. You don't want to do that, huh? <laughs> pass bipartisan privacy legislation to protect our children online. <laughs> harness. <laughs> harness the promise of AI to protect us from peril. <laughs> Ban AI voice impersonations and more. And keep our truly sacred obligation train and equip those we send into harm's way and care for them and their families when they come home and when they don't. <clears throat> That's why the song Support and Help of Dennis and the VA, I signed the PACT Act, one of the most significant laws ever, helping millions of veterans expose the toxins who now are battling more than 100 different cancers. Many of them don't come home, but we owe them and their families support. We owe it to ourselves to keep supporting our new health research agency called ARPA-H. And remind us 
remind us that we can do big things like end cancer as we know it. Do you trust any government organization that does health research? National Institute of Health? Yep. Yeah. Guys like Anthony Fauci? Mm -hmm. And we will. Let me close with this. Yay! I know you don't want to hear any more, Lindsay, but I got to say a few more things. I know it may not look like it, but I've been around a while. <laughs> when you get to be my age, certain things become clearer than ever. I know the American story. Again and again, I've seen the contest between competing forces in the battle for the soul of our nation, between those who want to pull America back to the past and those who want to move America into the future. My lifetime has taught me to embrace freedom and democracy, a future based on core values that have defined America, honesty, decency, dignity, equality, to respect everyone, to give everyone a fair shot, to give hate no safe harbor. Now, other people my age see it differently. The American story of resentment, revenge, and retribution, that's not me. I was born amid World War II when America stood for the freedom of the world. I grew up in Scranton, Pennsylvania, in Claymont, Delaware, among working-class people who built this country. I watched in horror as two of my heroes, like many of you did, Dr. King and Bobby Cunningham, were assassinated. And their legacies inspired me to pr pr pursue a, cure, a career in service. I left the law firm, became a public defender, because my city of Wilmington was the only city in America occupied by the National Guard after Dr. King was assassinated because of the riots. And I became a county councilman almost by accident. I got elected to the United States Senate when I had no intention of running at age 29. Then vice president, our first black president. Now president to the first women vice president. <laughs> In my career, I've been told I was too young. <laughs> By the way, they didn't let me on the Senate elevators for votes sometimes. They're not a joke. And I've been told I'm too old. Whether young or old, I've always been known, I've always known what endures. I've known our North Star. The very idea of America is that we're all created equal and deserves to be treated equally throughout our lives. We've never fully lived up to that idea, but we've never walked away from it either. And I won't walk away from it now. I'm optimistic. I really am. I'm optimistic, Nancy. My fellow Americans, the issue facing our nation isn't how old we are, it's how old are our ideas. Hate, anger, revenge, retribution are the oldest of ideas. But you can't lead America with ancient ideas that only take us back. You lead America, the land of possibilities. You need a vision for the future and what can and should be done. Tonight, you've heard mine. I see a future where, defending democracy, you don't diminish it. I see a future where we restore the right to choose and protect our freedoms, not take them away. The right to choose, the right to kill babies. I see a future where the middle class has finally has a fair shot and the wealthy have to pay their fair share in taxes. I see a future where we save the planet from the climate crisis and our country from gun violence. Above all, I see a future for all Americans. I see a country for all Americans. 
and I will always be president for all Americans, because I believe in America. I believe in you, the American people. You're the reason we've never been more optimistic about our future than I am now. So let's build the future together. Let's remember who we are. We are the United States of America. And there is nothing, nothing beyond our capacity when we act together. God bless you all, and may God protect our troops. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Let me just simply say this. My reaction is plain and simple. I could spend a lot of time. You may have noticed that near the end of this address, I just pretty much gave up and stopped and didn't even say much of anything as I continue to hear the nonsense that he's telling you. Here's the bottom line. The bottom line is America gave itself to the lust of its own flesh. The reality of it is we have chosen to love sin. Joe Biden is the result of that decision that we made. And the United States of America is being judged because of the actions of its desire for its insatiable desire for sin. And Joe Biden has been part of that judgment. We are looking at what happens when sin is made the priority instead of Christ. And this is terrible. All I will say is this. I pray every day that God heals this nation by a spiritual awakening where many will come to him. And I pray that the reason why the United States of America is inconsequential in Bible prophecy is because there was such a large spiritual awakening that it becomes inconsequential by virtue of the fact that it's vacated through the rapture. It doesn't look like it's going in that direction, but it does not absolve us of our responsibility to stand up for righteousness, folks. We have to stand up for righteousness. It's that simple. Tell the truth. Speak the truth. Speak out on behalf of the Lord. Tell people what is righteous. Do not allow the lies to continue. Be bold. Be courageous. Get involved in the political arena. Get involved in every single arena that life presents because we're running out of time. Jesus is coming soon. And what you're looking at right here, this picture, and I'll just very, very quickly just show you this picture right here is the picture of evil. That is the picture of evil. No more. Stand up for righteousness. God bless you guys.